worst rapper alive. Oops. Yeah, yeah. Big Mac's back on the mic like oops. Back on the horse, still jumping through hoops. I'm missing Lincoln Pink, I don't lip sync. Just to be clear, choking isn't my kink, but I do it anyway sometimes, I guess. Gotta laugh now, die later in my times of stress. I'm blessed, feeling good, charged up like a Hadouken. Mesdames et messieurs, garçons et filles, jokers of all ages, welcome back to another episode of the Worst Wrestling Podcast. You can find me every Saturday at 4.20 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, exclusively on the YouTubes and the audio versions on Spotify. I am your host with the least, Jack Luzne, a.k.a. the Fantasy Joker. Hey, guys, you know the drill by now. This is a comedy-fueled, grassroots, fan-driven wrestling podcast, and I want to be the James Ellsworth of wrestling podcasts, a.k.a. I want to be king of the jobbers. To do that, I need your help. I want to hear from you guys. I need you guys out there to be my EVPs. If you have ideas or questions for the show, please don't hesitate to hit me up on Twitter at Jack Lusne or on my other socials if you find me. Or if you prefer something less public, uh, you can always hit me up, send me emails to the fantasy joker420 at gmail.com. Today's show is packed, uh, just like all the stadiums that The Rock is selling out these days. Uh, dropping 40 minutes of promo basically in two days, putting AEW to shame without even having to put his tights on. Uh, I think it's hysterical when people try to compare the two. It's like Will Ospreay's debut had like half a million views over like two days. The Rocks thing uh, from last night has a million views in 10 hours. Like Different ballparks, people. Um, but anyways, The Rock... The Bloodline, that was the main story coming out of SmackDown. Uh, the tag match now is set. It's not set. They're still going to go through the motions of accepting it. But obviously, we know we're going to get the tag match that we all want now. Seth Rollins and Cody Rhodes versus The Rock and Roman Reigns. And they've set it up with interesting parameters to where... We don't actually know who's going to win this match. I think I know. I think it's pretty obvious that they're going to stack the deck against Cody. I do think The Rock and Roman Reigns are going over night one now, for sure. Uh, I actually would not hate if Cody Rhodes eats that pin. I know a lot of people are worried about, oh, does it make him look weak? And, you know, what about Seth Rollins? It's like, yeah, maybe Seth also could eat that pin, but... Either way, I think it makes more sense for Seth to not eat the pin because he's going to probably give up that world heavyweight title. So that's eating two pins at WrestleMania. I would rather have Cody eat the pin because ultimately the tag match doesn't matter. It just sets up that's going to be an even more stacked deck uh, having to go through the bloodline match. But then you basically... You know, you create an environment where Cody going over against all of the odds at WrestleMania, I think, is the cathartic release. That's the finish of the story that we all want and need. Uh, but just quickly going through the actual segment, which was 40 minutes long, uh, you know, Roman Reigns, I thought was exceptional during this segment, really looked annoyed before The Rock came out. Um, had the great line of uh, when he when he did acknowledge me and and then after the crowd pop he goes that used to be louder i thought it was great how he was playing like the moody spoiled champion that was ready to leave but he can't because he has to wait for big bro to come out the rock to deliver his promo and man the Rock, I was mesmerized. I got I gotta admit this was the one where I I'm so down with heel rock versus you know, baby face promo rock where, uh, you know, he's making fun of Austin Theory and it's just, I, it was kind of, yeah, uh, a little too shtick for me. Um, but man, <laughs> rock came in hot right away. The number one city for cocaine and meth use is Phoenix, Arizona. And I love this adjustment that he's made. Finally, your life has meaning. Finally, you cactus-loving crackheads have something worth shooting in your veins. Oh, my fuck. 
this is like straight attitude era from like I'm like I know that the ratings switched to 14. You almost forgot the rating switch uh happened a while back that they can get away with stuff like this, push that envelope, but they haven't done it for so long that it's just really uh you know came out it came from the ether the rock did. Uh you know, and then still though, genuinely had me laughing. Uh, you know, when he was cracking jokes about Solo Sokoa, you know, that's Solo's happy face, Solo singing the national anthem. Uh, he's got a great voice. All of that was hilarious. And yeah, pro wrestling is cool again. The Rock said it in the promo. You know, he hits them with uh, tonight in this crack den with popcorn. We're sold out. Uh, everyone's trying to go one on one with the great one, including all the women here, all the crackhead Karens and the meth head Marys. Calling Seth Rollins a walking cloud emoji over and over again. Uh, just everything was great. But my favorite part, my favorite moment is when The Rock. And if you smell. And Roman puts his hand on his arm to interrupt The Rock's catchphrase. And he says, I need something from you, big bro. I need you to acknowledge me. And the... Not just the fact that The Rock uh, did the the acknowledgement, which I thought was great, uh, you know, says to Roman, I acknowledge you, my tribal chief. Uh, but what I thought was an even uh, bigger touch, the way that he started, uh, if you smell, and then handed the microphone to Roman so he could finish the catchphrase, what the bloodline is cooking. Uh, and then, of course, The Rock throwing up the bang, bang, Scissor Gang, shout out to Jay White, Bullet Club Gold, and the Acclaimed. <laughs> but he did. Everyone keeps talking about the Rocks throwing up the L. He tucked the finger. The finger did get tucked this time, guys. So, you know, I don't know if that changes things with the tuck rule. <laughs> but basically, uh, you know, it was a great segment. Obviously, it's smashing social media. It sets up the tag match for night one at WrestleMania. Everything is on schedule. Now that they've set up the tag match, I want to see an Avengers style storyline almost play out at this point. And I think the way to do that is you treat night one like Infinity War and you treat night two like Endgame. So now that we have this tag match set up, you have The Rock go over, The Rock and Roman Reigns go over in the tag match. It sets up bloodline rules for the final match of WrestleMania, the main event for the undisputed WWE Championship, Roman Reigns versus Cody Rhodes, bloodline rules. So how does Cody Rhodes overcome the bloodline rules? He gets everybody. It's the Avengers-style storyline again of the you know meeting Thanos and his army in the ring. So the Rock and Roman Reigns, arguably a co-Thanos, whatever, however you want to look at that. But you could include, I think obviously Seth Rollins gets involved. Okay, that's a given. You could include Sami Zayn. I think it would be very interesting to include Jay Uso. And I think, you know, the man for the job. Bloodline, just picture it, right? Bloodline is, it's bloodline rules, bloodline standing tall. Cody has done everything he can. Seth and Sami Zayn and Jey Uso tried to intervene and they're all laid out. And all of a sudden, he knows you very well. Stone Cold Steve Austin returning at WrestleMania to just have a face-off and interaction with The Rock and basically take sides with Team Cody Rhodes in the Avengers-style battle for the championship in the Bloodline Rules match. Man, please, please, whatever wrestling gods are up there, just let this happen and I can die a happy man. Uh, we'll talk about 
Rhea Ripley versus Becky Lynch at WrestleMania because, you know, unlike Bailey and EO Sky, who have all the heat right now, uh, thanks to that great segment from Dakota Kai, which just a quick aside, I really love that they didn't tease this like Dakota Kai turn all the way to WrestleMania and just kind of got it over with right away because like everybody and their grandmother knew Dakota Kai was betraying Bailey. I think the surprise was that it happened so soon to happen so quickly on the SmackDown match uh, and really set that stage for Bailey has to face all the odds, uh, all of, you know, this group that she created. Plus she was such uh she was such a heel for so long with damage control. She has basically ruined all of her outside relationships. So she truly is on an Island. There's nobody in the locker room that's really willing to help her. I mean, they've set up this story beautifully. And on the flip side, you got Rhea Ripley and Becky Lynch, who I'm I'm over Becky Lynch. I love, I used to love Becky Lynch. I still love her as a person. I still love her as a wrestler. I can't, I can't take the Becky Lynch uh face promos anymore. Um, you know, she just it's like she's trying too hard and she'll just say stuff that just comes off, you know. It's like it falls flat. She's just not funny. The way that it's like she's trying to be funny like The Rock. But, you know, when you're doing that, it's like you, you're you doing like the, the kind of good guy PG version of it. Of, oh, uh, look at all these Muppets coming up to the ring to challenge me. It's like, eh, eh. And honestly, the Liv Morgan pushback, like I'm good on that too. Uh, just at this point, um, mentally emotionally checked out on this feud don't care at all about uh it's going to be a cold feud and a build but it's going to be a great match so you know it really doesn't matter what they're going to do between now and then i'm just excited to see the actual match as it plays out at wrestlemania i do think that there could be a double turn per se obviously the challenge with turning Rhea Ripley face is that you have the judgment day that you, you could turn almost judgment day face even except for Dom Mysterio. <laughs> that one, I think you would struggle with e even still, but the way that you would do that whole transition in my mind is Rhea Ripley already coming off goodwill from the elimination chamber. If she could pivot that into the North American audience, you keep her as not a face, not a baby face, none of that shitty baby face promos, but kind of just like the badass heel leader of judgment day. Naturally people will just start cheering for that because that is that always gets over in WWE is when they have like the really badass heels that end up being too cool to stay heel and they eventually turn face. The problem is a lot of times when they do that, they then think, oh well, now they gotta go cut baby face promos. Nah. -ah. But Triple H, of all people, understands that you know, D Generation X didn't get over because he went out, started cutting shitty baby face promos. Um, so I really enjoy uh, you know, all of the back end work that they're doing in WWE right now. And I think because of that, there is an opportunity that you could turn all of Judgment Day face. Here's how you do it. Really takes only two steps. Number one, Rhea Ripley just embraces. I'm a fucking, I'm the Roman Reigns. I'm badass. Uh, I'm the main star attraction. She's already doing that anyways, but like really kind of just playing that up. I think, you could turn her face kind of almost what you saw from the Australian crowd. And, you know, just by picking the right opponents, like Anaya Jax, for example, and then the way that you turn Judgment Day is so simple. You just have them embrace our truth. Uh, and, and you have Le Rhea Ripley be the... Uh, the the reason for that you know what i mean like the the catalyst is the word i was looking for the catalyst for why do they suddenly start embracing our truth well because rhea ripley basically convinces them hey instead of pushing our truth out let's embrace him and turn his chaos 
outward instead of inward. Because right now, obviously, you are suffering from the chaos that is our truth. If you were to somehow embrace it and turn it outward, you could use it in your favor. At the same time, you create a dynamic where now the Judgment Day as a whole, I mean, Finn is cool as fuck. People like Damian Priest. Uh, J.D. McDonough and uh, Don Mysterio are the ones that obviously they're like the Ringo star of the Beatles here. And they're going to have, they're going to get to go along for that ride, but they're not going to be true baby face. I get that part of it, but Finn priest and Rhea, man, I could see that as like a dominant badass heel faction that actually is just getting over, continues to get over and becomes like face. But while maintaining like the, the actual heel personas that got them there in the first place. So, all in all to say, like, you know, again, the, the Rhea Ripley versus Becky Lynch feud in and of itself, I really don't care about. But the actual match and what they might do with that coming out of Mania, a lot of that I do find interesting. So there is there is a little bit to, to grab on there. But I think, obviously, the most exciting women's match that's going to be happening at WrestleMania is going to be Bayley and EO Sky. And we'll see if Bailey is able to drum up some kind of backup or if she's just going to go out there solo. Uh, and I think what happens if is they, they're going to tell the story, I think, of Bailey really giving it her truest effort uh, with no backup and ultimately succumbing to the numbers game and EO Sky will retain at WrestleMania. That's kind of my prediction for that match. All right, we'll step away from WWE for a little bit here. We will get into AEW Revolution, uh, which is going to be coming up on Sunday, tomorrow. I'm very excited for this pay-per-view, um, even though there's a lot of stuff because I'm not admittedly as familiar with AEW's day-to-day -day bookings um, as I have been with WWE for the past couple of months. You know, leading up to WrestleMania season, I've been paying a lot more attention to the E than AEW. Um, but, you know, it is nice uh, change of pace to see a, a pay-per-view card with 10 fucking matches on it. Like, holy shit. So this is definitely going to be a wrestling-heavy pay-per-view. Um, and there's, there's stuff to get excited about, you know. Um, let's get some of the smaller stuff out of the way. Um, you know... On the, on the card, you know, Julia Hart and Sky Blue versus Chris Statlander and Willow Nightingale. Like, okay, I, honestly, I'm not sure. To me, that's like a preview match, maybe like the opener. Um, but it's fine. You know, it it's there. I, I feel like you could put that on any Dynamite or Collision or any of their other shows, though. Um, this was a weird one, the all-star scramble match, which I'm still not hundred percent sure what that format means, but it's basically, they're doing like a money in the bank style, you know, in terms of the stipulation of like, whoever the winner is, is going to get a future, uh, AEW world heavyweight title match. Um, I don't know if there's actually ladders involved. Originally, this was supposed to be like the meat on meat on meat match of Hobbs, uh, Lance Archer, and Brian Cage, and they decided to scrap that for this. So instead, we're getting Chris Jericho, Powerhouse Hobbs, Lance Archer, uh, Hook, Brian Cage, Magnus, and Dante Martin in, again, the all-star scramble match. Um, if it's me... I want to see Brian Cage win. I actually really like Brian Cage. I think he's kind of underrated. Uh, just, you know, he's, for a big guy, man, he moves so good. Uh, I wouldn't mind seeing Hook, though, set up a future title shot for Hook, who they've booked extremely strong throughout his entire run. Um, underrated, though, Dante Martin could be a sneaky... I could see them going that route with Dante Martin. They really like that kid. Uh, I, I think he, it's funny. He kind of looks like John Cena. I don't know if anyone's ever noticed that. Just put John Cena's face next to Dante Martin and tell me it doesn't look like his illegitimate son. Um, 
And then you have uh, Orange Cassidy versus Roderick Strong for the AEW International title. I will say one thing. AEW's got too many fucking titles because I can't keep track of all these weird fucking titles they've got. Um, but yeah, the AEW International title. I love Roddy Strong. He's one of my favorite underrated in-ring wrestlers. King of the Backbreakers, the suplex, uh, suplex machine, like, Man, Roderick Strong is money. So I'm excited about this match. I really like Orange Cassidy. I understand how you could be on the other side of that. Uh, but for me, that's one of my daughter's favorite wrestlers. I really enjoy Orange Cassidy. I love that comedy wrestling bit. The whole shtick of he doesn't care until he does. The hands in the pocket. All of it is great. Um, so I, re I really like that. I'm invested in that. I'm not as invested in these next two. Uh, and I'm actually genuinely a little bit confused. Christian Cage versus Daniel Garcia for the AEW TNT title. I thought he was feuding with uh, Adam Copeland. Uh, so, again, this is where it's like I haven't been following the day-to-day -day show, so I don't know exactly what's going on there. But ultimately, the match itself should be fine. I think Daniel Garcia is great. I think the little... This, the dance, that's stupid as fuck. I am not down with that. That, honestly, like, just... I don't know how or why that is the thing that got over uh, for him when he's such an excellent wrestler. And uh, after he had, like, that whole thing of, like, uh, with Daniel Bryan and uh, Chris Jericho, like, deciding who his mentor should be. And, like, ever since then, all this guy does is these stupid pelvic thrusts. So, that's a match. That's going to happen. Uh, Eddie Kingston versus Brian Danielson in a titles versus handshake match. What the fuck? So, I mean, again, Eddie Kingston, um, I appreciate Eddie Kingston as a person and his journey, not my kind of wrestler. Uh, I just, I'm more of the Brian Danielson guy. I think, uh, so I, without even knowing, uh, much about this match, I understand at least the dynamic of where they're going with, you know, Eddie Kingston obviously not being like a super technical guy, doesn't get the respect necessarily of even, you know, guys like uh, John Moxley and Cesaro and like a lot of these guys in the Blackpool Combat Co Club that he's had interactions and matches with. Uh, even, you know, wrestlers with similar styles. I think obviously, you know, Eddie Kingston is very much a personality promo guy, not a five-star mat technician. Uh, so I, again, I get the concept uh, that he's putting his titles on the line and that uh, if he loses or if Brian Danielson loses, not only does he not get those titles, but he has to shake Eddie Kingston's hand, which I'm assuming is like some kind of sign of respect. Uh, but I mean, you know, Brian Daniels gonna pull a fucking good match out of uh wet paper bag. So honestly, like it, it's going to be good. And I, again, there are aspects to what Eddie Kingston does that I like, but overall, like in terms of like watching like his actual matches, it's not really my thing. Um, speaking of not my thing, <laughs> Kanasaki Takashita, uh, versus Will Ospreay, uh, I, I watched the segment of Will Ospreay's AEW debut, and my God, I am so glad he is getting probably he's probably going to get away from this ratings vacuum, this this suck wind that is Don Callis and this just terrible faction that is Don Callis family. Man, you talk about go away heat like this is. This is bad. And, you know, Will Ospreay uh, coming in as, like, a huge face and immediately, you know, sh dampering, like, your booking dampers and shits on that by having his own faction come out and get just relentlessly booed by comparison. Uh, but already, you know, Ospreay was great, kind of dropping hints of, like, yeah, this might not be for me for long uh, in terms of, like, staying with Don Callis' family. Setting up the match uh, with Kanoska Takeshita. Uh, oops. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I'm just I, this Kanoska guy. Uh, I don't I don't get the push for him. Just like I'm sure he's a great wrestler, but like I why why do I care about this guy? 
He's supposed to be like the main heel of a faction for a guy that nobody fucking can stand anymore. Like I, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. Uh, but anyways, uh, some of the bigger matches on the card, uh, obviously. Oh, sorry. Actually, before we get to the big ones, I forgot uh, FTR versus Blackpool Combat Club. So many fucking matches. Uh, so yeah, uh, fuck the revolution or whatever the fuck they're called now. Uh, uh, the revival. That's what it is. Fuck the revival. So uh, they're taking on uh, Blackpool Combat Club. Uh, that one could go either way. I'm hoping FTR, the tag specialist, get that one. Uh, and then here are really um, the big ones on the card for the AEW Women's Championship. Timeless Tony Storm versus Deanna Perazzo. Uh, I think that's going to be a, an underrated match. I think that could potentially not steal the show, but it's going to be a really good match. I'm very excited about that. Tony Storm and uh, Deanna Perazzo are both excellent wrestlers. They have been uh, friends in the past, so they have a rapport. Um, a chemistry. I think this is going to be, again, maybe one of the underrated best matches of the night uh, and a highlight of the AEW women's division. So I'm excited for that. I am excited, obviously, I think like most people for Sting and Darby versus the Young Bucks in the Tornado Tag Match for the AEW Tag Team Championships. This is Sting's retirement match. Uh, so regardless of the outcome, I think we're all just there to enjoy and celebrate the career of the man known as Sting. And uh, finally, for the AEW World Heavyweight Championship, it is, in fact, a triple threat. I was confused about that at one point, uh, but it did turn out to be a triple threat match. Samoa Joe, Samoa Joe, versus Hangman Adam Page, a.k.a. Logan Paul's mentor, versus Swerve Strickland uh, with Prince uh, Yanene or whatever the fuck he's called coming out at the same time for the AEW world title. Going to be a hell of a match. Uh, so, yeah, the whole card, I think, stacks up pretty nicely. I'm really excited for the main title matches. Um, and then, you know, underrated match on the card, for me, Orange Cassidy versus Roderick Strong, I'm excited about. And uh, FTR versus Blackpool Combat Club, I think is just going to be a good knockdown, uh, knockdown match. So I'm really excited for this pay-per-view uh, that I'll be watching tomorrow night, along with all you guys. We will get into some fan questions here before we knock off and get on out of here. Uh, what uh, This one coming straight. From Twitter, uh, I pulled this person's tweet, um, so hopefully they don't get mad at me. But basically, they were asking, uh, what do you think is the main difference between the Rock's TKO board member angle and the EVP Young Bucks angle? And this is from at air gold underscore. Uh, so make sure that you go drop them a follow. Um, I mean, right off the bat, <laughs> cachet, stardom, and shtick. That's I. Those are the three words I wrote uh, in my doc for the show. Um, basically, the way I look at it is, um, the Rock is famous, and the Young Bucks are not. <laughs> if I if I say the Young Bucks to non wrestling fans, they have no idea who the fuck I'm talking about, even to casuals. Uh, you know, shout out to my guy at FF Hustler for 20. I'm going to be having him on the show next week. We're going to be doing a breakdown of our top 10 favorite WrestleMania moments. Um, so that'll be a fun show. Make sure you guys subscribe and check uh, so that you can get notified for that. Uh, but anyways, getting off track. Uh, if I told him the young box, he'd be like, he, he'd have like a vague notion of who they were. Everybody and their grandmother knows who The Rock is. So already there is a huge amount of cachet and stardom uh, in terms of difference. And then, again, in terms of cachet, you talk about, yeah, okay, the Young Bucks ran off and started their own little wrestling company. That's very cute. The Rock uh, essentially coming in as a prominent CEO-type figure with TKO um, on the uh, on the 
you know, as like a head board member, um, very different levels to that game, right? WWE being pretty much a billion dollar company, uh, you know, being the NFL version of the pro wrestling world, like that is so much different than uh, the level that AEW is at. Uh, so, you know, where The Rock comes in and is, you know, flexing his power, the Young Bucks just come off as bratty. And obviously that's part of the shtick that they're doing, and that's the real difference. The Rock carries himself in such a way, delivers promos in such a way. Um does interviews in such a way where he is always carrying himself as the rock with a sense of grandeur, right? Whereas the young bucks are very much almost going with like a, not quite a comedy angle, but kind of almost bordering on it, right? They're going with uh, a satirical angle. Um, And that's the thing. When you're doing satire and when you're doing shtick, that doesn't come across the same way as a person like The Rock, where not only do I believe that he has that level of power, I believe that he believes in his own mind that he has that level of power. And that's kind of the difference. I can get with the idea that The Rock mentally believes his own shit, and I don't feel that way about the Young Bucks. At the end of the day, I know that the Young Bucks are essentially the opposite of the characters that they're now portraying on screen. And that's fine. There's a place for that. But in wrestling, the most successful characters throughout wrestling history have always been variations of the real life person turned up to 11. The Rock is not playing a character per se. The Rock is playing himself, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, the way he views himself, the way he carries himself, the way he portrays himself. He's been doing it since the 90s, since he turned heel basically uh, and took over Nation of Domination and realized and, you know, has ascended to the position that he is in now, um, has always carried himself a certain way, has always, uh, you know, believed in his own shit. And you could tell, again, same way that in a parallel, Stone Cold Steve Austin was very representative of his version of culture and his version of believing his own shit, that he was in fact the toughest son of a bitch walking God's green earth. You bought into that because he bought into that. And as much as I love the young bucks, I don't think that they really buy into the idea that they are evil EVPs. This is more again, coming from a satirical place of it's almost a wink and a nod to the fan base but you're doing it to real diehards. And as someone who spends a lot of time on my own shows doing winks and nods to myself, you are intentionally reducing your audience appeal when you do that. I know I'm doing that when I make jokes that maybe three people in the world besides myself will understand, but it makes me laugh. And that's what the Young Bucks are doing essentially with AEW and the EVP angle is almost kind of, again, like their way of making fun of the fact that, you know, fans view them potentially in that way. So it's a, it's a fine line to walk. And I, there are definitely aspects to it that I like, but I think overall, yeah, you can't even really compare the two. The Rock being a TKO board member and having all this power in WWE is 100% more believable than the fact that the Young Bucks would start this company and then treat all their friends like shit. It, that one, again, behind the curtains, behind the scenes, it's like when The Rock goes back behind... The cam, uh, the curtain. He knows the cameras are still going. The cameras are twenty four seven for the Rock. Uh, 
when he's in his own fucking house, The Rock is basically pretending he's on camera. That's how he lives his whole life. I don't believe, again, that Matt Jackson, uh, uh, Matt and Nick Jackson are going home and being like, uh, hello, Matthew, you must call me Nick. Like, they're coming up with that stuff and being like, ha-ha, this is funny, let's get into the show. You know what I'm saying? There's a there's levels to this shit. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my thoughts on my expanded thoughts on why I do believe that there is a different reaction and portrayal uh for the way that The Rock has set up this kind of TKO board member authority figure um heel role for himself, which is really just a spin-off of his own heel character that he's always done, versus the young bucks kind of again with like the satire and the shtick and the winks and the nods and the this is supposed to be you know it's supposed to be yeah we're heels but it's also supposed to be funny so it's like well am i supposed to like you then or am i supposed to hate you uh, again they kind of they're working it out it feels more like uh the next question uh I just saw a lot of um, back and forth on Maxine Dupree and the reaction of the fan at the house show, uh, basically uh, telling her that she sucks or whatever. Um, and there's, I get, I understand both sides of the argument. So essentially the question is, what are my thoughts on Maxine Dupree and wrestling fans in general going to shows and observing kayfabe versus reality. And that is exactly where I think the line is drawn. When you are booing heels, or even if you're booing a a baby face that you don't like, when you are doing it within the confines of their character, within kayfabe, that's where you can kind of convince me that anything goes. If I want to tell Seth Rollins that I hate his stupid boots, it doesn't matter if he's heel or face. Like there are certain aspects, but if if you know, if you're talking about a younger wrestler who is on a house show who is actively trying to get in-ring work and progress and improve their skills, And you're just shitting on, oh, you can't fucking wrestle, you fucking suck. Yeah, you know what? You suck as a person. I don't give a shit how much you paid for your ticket. I don't give a fuck what's going on in your life that makes you feel that you are entitled to fucking treat performers that way in any sport. Whether it is football, whether it's fucking hockey, whether it's fucking ballet, whether it's fucking pro wrestling. I don't give a shit what the format is comedians even comedians and wrestlers more than other entertainment uh, fields have to deal with hecklers and that is to a degree fine but when you make it personal you i hate this fucking shit too of like You know what you're fucking doing. You know when you're being antagonistic as a person. And there's nothing I hate more than a person who's being intentionally antagonistic. And then when the person reacts, you're like, oh, oh, well, where's this reaction coming from? Like, honestly, go fuck yourself. The the lack of accountability for just real life in this day and age, that's something that really irks my soul. It's something I try to impart upon my children that you are accountable for your actions and your actions can cause a reaction. Now it doesn't justify the reaction, but you cannot take yourself out of it and act like you were not accountable in any way, shape or form for the leading events for what led up to that action to happen. Now, if you, it, there are, Random occurrences. I'm not saying that those never happen in life. If you're on the street, minding your own business, you don't say a word, you look in the other direction, some guy comes and slaps you on the back of the head, or like that fucking loser internet uh, YouTuber prankster fucking RKOing uh, people from behind and shit and then running away. That is an example of, you know, you didn't do anything to instigate 
you didn't do anything. You know what I'm saying? That's true innocence. You go to a fucking house show and tell your wrestler, oh, you fucking suck. You can't fucking wrestle, ba ba ba. And then, like, being surprised that there's pushback to that. Like, no, go fuck yourself. Okay. Um, you can say that you are within your rights to act however you want because you paid for a ticket. Well, guess what? That wrestler, to a degree, is within their rights to react to you however they see fit because that's their fucking job. Um, so honestly, if I was Maxine Dupree, I would have done what Tiffany Stratton said. I would have told you to go fuck yourself. Uh, and I think that's what all the wrestlers should do when they have to deal with assholes like this. So that's my two cents on it. We'll lighten up here a little bit before we cut out uh, for today's show. Besides the main event of uh, night one and night two, so obviously all of the stuff going on with The Rock and Cody Rhodes and the Bloodline, which WrestleMania match are you most looking forward to? So um, for me, it's not set in stone yet. I am extremely excited to see what happens with Gunther's Intercontinental Championship, Gunther being my favorite wrestler currently on the WWE roster. I love every single one of his matches. They're all fucking bangers. So it really doesn't matter who ultimately it's going to be. Uh, obviously, on the last round, we saw them tease a lot of different competitors. Uh, I've really enjoyed Chad Gable uh, doing his promotion promo work it means more to me um so and i said on the last show that i would like to see uh gunther versus Sami Zayn. i would like to see Sami Zayn go over and get that intercontinental championship that's one outcome i would be totally fine if they want to go the chad gable route uh chad gable one of my favorite underrated wrestlers uh always has been since his time with American Alpha. I thought he specifically reminded me of a young Kurt Angle, which is why it was so fucking weird and stupid that they were like, that they picked Jason Jordan to be Kurt Angle's son. Cause like Chad Gable was right there. It literally looks, wrestles, acts like a young Kurt Angle almost. Like you could have just straight up convinced me uh, that that was actually Kurt Angle's illegitimate son. Like I would have bought that. Hook, line, and sinker, the same way we all thought Undertaker and Kane were really brothers back in the day. Sorry to spoil that for any of you out there that somehow didn't know that. But yeah, um, whether they go the Sami Zayn route, whether they go with Chad Gable, whether it's Jay Uso, whether it's someone from Judgment Day, uh, whether it's a collection of all of them in some kind of multi-man match, I don't really care. All I know is I am excited to see Gunther Russell at WrestleMania. That is it for me today. I appreciate you guys as always. Thank you so much for tuning in if you've made it this far into the show. Again, I would love to get your guys' support out there. I need you guys to be my young bucks, uh, be my EVPs, uh, executive vice presidents. Uh, so if you have ideas or if you have questions for the show once again please send them in at jack lewis day on twitter you can hit me up usually i'll make a post to day of or day before asking for questions so you can go there uh, you can hit me up on my other socials i'm on facebook and i'm on tiktok and of course you can always email me directly if you want something a little bit more subvert uh the fantasy joker 420 at gmail.com one more time the fantasy joker 420 at gmail.com all small no spaces send me your questions i would love to answer them on the show and as always super kick that subscribe button and i'll catch you guys on the flip side oh yeah my positive contact results in affirmative impact never pull the rise on raps i'm never primitive but then vicious kept the risks i read the terror potency epicetic genes yo ever the HMCs at a short and never speaks some of the is like some of the razor blades and grease in your bare feet i see your fucking colleagues misprize you very much to your dismay so today i can say you won't be running away hold your tail between your legs i'm gonna advocate when you fail with flow stakes i'll take a hacksaw to you cockeyed mumble rap slack jaws we be shredded on a side like some coleslaw the double time with that clothesline from hell like bradshaw i'm toxic like
off the chart. A dying breed like animal.